So if we look at number 1.1a, we have to define a population and variable. So for the data, define the population and variable of interest. Here's a scenario. The following data set is the number of parking tickets a police officer issued each month for a year. So in this case, so for this case, the population would be the police officer tickets for one full year. And then the variable of interest here is the number of parking tickets. For 1.1b, we're going to read tables and make conclusions. Consider the table below about life expectancy for men and women in the U.S. So it looks like what we have here is for about a two-year time slot, the um, life expectancy for a man and then a female for different time periods. The source here does come from the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, which would be a valid source. So the first question right here, which gender made the biggest gain in life expectancy between two, any two consecutive periods measured, and when was that? Now, the key to this problem is that they want the biggest gain in life expectancy. So that right here is a number count. Um, it's not a percent. So all I have to do is look at it by gender because they want to know which gender and in which period did this happen. I want to compare, for example, uh, the change from 1909 to 1911, this time period where the men were 49.86, and go back to this next other two-year time period. And you're going to look and see where the biggest gain happened and for which gender did that happen. So this is actually quite a bit of work. You need to compare these two and these two, these two, these two, and these two, and continuing on. And then you need to switch gears and do that same thing for the females till you find the biggest change. When you do that analysis, you're going to discover it was between these two time periods for the men. So what would you write on this for your final answer is that it was the men and it was between the time period of 1909 to 1911 and comparing it to the time period of 1919 to 1921. Now the other question on this one is to compare the trend in the life expectancy between the men, the men and the women in the U.S. So what they want you to do is to look at the life expectancy and the trend of it for the men. So notice and see what happens with the men and then compare that with the life expectancy trend of the females. So you need to talk about what you see in both of them. So as you look at the men, the uh, life expectancy age of 47.88 goes all the way up to 75.2 for the men. For the women at 50.70, and it always increases up to 80.4. Take a look, and you're going to notice for each of these genders, it's always increasing. It doesn't look like it ever dips back down. So one of the comparisons that you could say is that both genders show a substantial increase in life expectancy from the 1900s to the 2004. There's another thing that you can notice between them though is instead of just looking at the analysis going this way, noticing the men increase and the females both increase, compare them going this way. Um, you're going to notice here the gap between the males and the females is roughly three years. When we get up here and as we go um, into the higher years closer to 2004, the gap actually gets to be a little bit bigger. So that is one thing to make note is the gap uh, between the two is also widened. So again, what I mean by this last comment here, the gap, is the gap right here in the very beginning is about a three-year time spread. The gap here is almost a five-year time spread. So it looks like um, that's a significant difference. Le learning Objective 1.1c, read graphs and make conclusions. So here it says, consider the following graphs which show the age of the quarterbacks on winning and losing teams in the Super Bowl each year. Uh, so what we have here is, if you notice, it's gonna, this is the age of the Super Bowl winning quarterbacks and the age of the Super Bowl losing quarterbacks. Uh, this right here is a bar graph. It's not a histogram because they're not touching. But we have different intervals here from 22 to 24, uh, 25 to 27, and so forth and it's the count of all of the players. 
So here we have a bar graph, which is meant to look somewhat like a histogram. And then here we have a box and whisker plot. So the question here says, what percent of Super Bowl winning quarterbacks have been under the age of 28? Now here they want a percent. So you need to think about where's the most logical place to get that data. Do you want to read it from the bar graph or histogram like graph? Or do you want to go to the box and whisker plot? And I want an actual percent. So the best way to do this is to actually go into this histogram like graph and actually count how many players that is and physically compute the percent. So to do that, first note we're looking at the winning quarterbacks. So we're at this one right here. And they want to know have been under the age of 28. So under the age of 28 would then be these two bars. If you tally up the total in those two bars, here we're going to have 13. Here we have 2. So it looks like there's 15, but they want a percent, so we need to know how many players there are. If you add up the totals in all of the bars, what you're going to get in here is that there are 43 players. So it's 15 divided by 43, and as a percent, rounded to one decimal place, it's 34.9%. Now I do want to highlight for this problem, to be careful, don't look at the box plot for it. If you go to the winning quarterbacks, which is here, and you look at the age of 28 or younger, it's probably going to be somewhere within here. Now I don't know specifically, I do know it's less than 50% of the players, but I can't get a really good percentage on that, so therefore go to this histogram-like bar graph. Going to 1.2a, they want us to calculate the mean, median, and mode given the data set. The specific question here is compute the mean for this data set. We're back to the police officer data set. So again, this is the number of tickets issued um, by a police officer uh, for each month. So what we have is 12 months. They want to know the mean number of tickets per month is what that would be. So to do this, what I would do to start showing my work is I'm going to take 53 plus 48. I would show all the numbers. I'm going to dot, dot, dot to the end and put 47 as my last one. Divide that by 12. And when you do that, you're going to get that X bar or the mean of my sample is 54.42 tickets is the average number of tickets this police officer writes in a month. Continue now with that learning objective of mean, median, and mode. Here's two true and false questions. The first one here says, if there is an even number of elements in a data set and all the elements are integers, so it's positive or negative whole numbers, including zero, then the median will be a fraction. So what I would do for this is just come up with a data set of an even number of elements. Maybe you want to do four elements um, and just see if this would be true or not. What if the four pieces of data I had, and I'm going to choose an integer, was a two? What if they were all twos? So to find the median on here, you'd have to go in and you'd have to cross off this and this, then you're left with these two. So to find the answer, what you would do is two plus two divided by two. The median here is two. And it says here that the median will be a fraction. Uh, this answer here is clearly going to be false. Um, it's not necessarily going to happen. It could happen though. Uh, what if the numbers here were the three and a three, for example, if this was a 3, then the new median would be a 2 plus 3 divided by 2, or 5 halves, which is the fraction. But in this case, it is false. The next one here, calculating the mode of a data set does not require that you know the size of the data set. The key here is to remember what mode is. Mode means the most frequent number. Um, I don't necessarily need to know the size of the data set. That means, is there 10 elements in the data set or 20 elements? I just need to be able to see the number that shows up most frequently. So for this one, it is true that I do not necessarily need to know the size of the data set. Learning objective 1.2b, uh, write the mean or summation using the summation notation. What do they want us to do here again is we have our parking uh, ticket data. And it says here, write the mean using sigma notation. So that means we want to sum. So put down the letter sigma. Uh, this indicates we want to sum. What do we want to sum? We want to sum all of these x's. And I'm going to say sum the x sub. I'm going to call those an i. 
But notice here, they don't have I's, they have numbers. And the numbers go from 1 to 12 in consecutive counting order. So what you do for that is I want the I's to start at 1 and they end at 12. This right here means to total. If I want to find the average of that, I do need to finish the problem off. I need to then take this and divide that answer by 12 of the elements. In Learning Objective 1.2c, compute weighted average. Here it looks like we have, here it says Albin's course uh, uses a 4.0 grade scale and it follows as this accordingly. Um, it then weighs the grade by the number of semester hours for each course. So right here are semester hours. Compute Albin's grade point average based on the report below. So be careful, what you do not want to do is add up all of these numbers and divide by the fact that there's five courses. If these hours were equally balanced, where they all set a four, then I could do that. But because they're different, we must compute the weighted average. So let's go ahead and set that up. So to get started, we see that there's first four hours, and he had a C plus at that. A C plus is a 2.5. So he gets the 0.2.5 four times. Then we're going to notice the next is three hours. At a B plus was 3.5 grade point. Another three hours, this time at a B, and that's going to be a 3.0. And then four hours at a B, that's another four times a 3.0. And then three hours at an A, so three hours divided by a 4.0 for an A. Now again, be careful. You do not want to take this and divide it by five courses. What we have here is the various number of credits. So if you add up how many credits there are, you'll see that here there's a total of 17 credit hours. So right here, I'll divide it by 17. So if we just look at this calculation right here and simplify, what you're going to get is the GPA is 3.15. Now in this particular test, you will not be asked to look at a learning objective 1.2D of evaluating summation notation in order of operations, but that could come up on a test later on in the year. Let's look at 1.3A. This one right here wants us to go ahead and uh, compute frequency and relative frequency. So here it says, consider the table below of the distribution of 1,150 rolls of a single die. Compute the relative frequency. So first thing, we have a six-sided die. Uh, it looks like right here, if I were to tally up this whole column, it's going to be 1,150. Um, this here is called frequency because it's the number. So that is the frequency. Relative frequency just means the percent of the total. So what you would do for getting a one on the die the relative frequency of that is 192 out of 1,150. If you put that in a calculator, you'll get the decimal answer of 0 0.167. For the next one, you do 202 out of 1,150. Simplify that to a decimal, 0 0.175. The remainder of them will look like this. Now the one thing to note about relative frequency if I were to add up all of these totals, it would come back to equaling 100% or the whole. Looking at 1.3b, we're going to read, construct, and interpret frequency and relative frequency histograms. Um, again, this right here is technically not considered a histogram because the bars are not touching. That is their intention though. This technically is a bar graph. Um, here's the question. Uh, all uh, major league baseball players who hit over 30 home runs in the 2008 season are represented in this figure below. So the question is, how many players hit more than 30 home runs in 2008? Well, if you read the table carefully, this is the batters with over 30 home runs. Um, this is the count of batters that had between 31 and 33 home runs. This is the count of batters that had between 34 and 36 homes runs, and so forth. So the way to do this, all you have to do because they want uh, more than 30 would be every single one of these bars, if you add up the frequencies, will give you the total count. And when you do that, you will get that there'll be 25. Where that came from, 
right here is 12, 6, 5, 1, and 1. 1.3c wants us to determine the shape of the distribution. So for the graph above and 1.3b, describe this shape. So you're going to have three choices. The distribution is either going to be symmetric, which means if you were to draw a curve around it, it would have somewhat of that shape. If it were skewed right, it means the tail of the distribution will be on the right end, so it would look something like this. If it were skewed left, the tail would then be on the left side, so it's going to look something like this. So if you go back up here to the distribution, and if you draw a curve around it, if you look at that, you should be able to notice that this one is considered skewed right. Learning Objective 1.4a wants us to estimate the five number summary and percentiles for box plots. So consider the box plot below, which tabulates the passing yards completed by the top 32 NFL quarterbacks in 2008. So what we have here is a total dealing with uh, 32 quarterbacks and again where their yards are. So estimate the five number summary from the box plot. So let's go ahead and do that. First thing to remember is there's five components, the min, quartile one, the median, quartile three, and the max. The min is here, the max is here. Um, this is a modified box plot, which means they did the outlier test. The maximum is the outlier there. Uh, this line straight down there is going to be quartile 2 or the median. This is quartile 1 and this is quartile 3. One thing to do remember about the box plot that this is where the percentiles hit. So remember right here is roughly the 50th percentile. This line is roughly the 25th. Here you're going to have the 75th percentile. Um, our maximum is roughly the 100th percentile. And if you had to give a name to it, the zero or the first percentile, roughly. So just read them and let's see what we get. Now these, these are some rough estimates, but let's check it out. I said the minimum here was at about 1,500. A quartile one, which is right here, about 2,600. Uh, the median or quartile two, about 3,400. Quartile three, I did about 3,700. And the maximum, which is this outlier, I said about 5,050. The next question, between which two values, is the middle 50% of the data. Remember, all of these are chunked off into quarters. So this is one quarter of the data. Here's a second quarter, a third quarter, and a fourth quarter of data. They want the middle 50% of the data. So the middle 50% of the data would sit right in between here. They do want to know the specific values. So I would say between 2,600 and about 3,700, which means between quartile 1 and quartile 3. Now, if they were to ask you where is the top 25% of the data, for example, that would be right in here. The bottom 25% of the data, right in there. Now, learning objective 1.4b, they want us to construct and interpret box plots. So here we have some data set about the number of people who attended a book club meeting in, um, at a library in the first 14 weeks of the year. There's 14 sets of data here, so it would be um, the number of people per week. So by the way, this means in week 1, 82 people showed up. In week 2, 78. They want us to draw a box plot. So you can go ahead and what we need to do to get, do the box plot is actually get the five number summary. So if you get the five number summary, here's what you should get. Now, when you do this, be careful. Make sure to put the numbers in increasing order. It's 14 pieces of data. When you find the one in the middle, there isn't one exactly. So this is where you have to take the average of the two. It's going to be 81.5 for the median. Now, this 81 does is considered the lower half of the data. So for the lower half of the data, look at the data this way. The median here, there is one right in the middle. It's 77, so that's Q1. Uh, 57 is our minimum. Um, on the other side, we're going to look at this way. Uh, so the middle data here is 86 or Q3, and then 97 is the max. Now when you sketch this data, be careful. Notice above here, the number line is on the bottom. The box plot is not drawn on top of the number line, so let's sketch that. So first thing in sketching, make sure your number line is somewhat appropriate. It needs to be drawn to scale. Don't skew it. Um, so then you can just plot it. The 57s are min, the 97s the high, 
Uh, 81 and a half is going to roughly be here. And then we're going to go to 77, which will probably be about right here. 86 about there. Make your box. Connect the dots. And we have a regular box plot. Now the second part of this, you may be asked to um, compare or talk about box plot data. It says again, consider the following graphs of the ages of the quarterbacks of winning and losing teams in the Super Bowl. They want us to compare and contrast the two distributions using the box plots. So be careful. Um, by the way, compare means what they have in common. Contrast means how they're different. So if you look at just the box plots, you're going to notice if you're trying to find something where they look similar, uh, the range on this box plot or the variation in it is very similar between the two. So the spread between the min and the maximum in terms of the losing quarterbacks and the winning quarterbacks is very similar. So then I just stated what I said here for compare. Now to contrast these, uh, that means where are they different, uh, one of the things you might notice is the median age. Uh, the median age for the winning quarterbacks is right here versus right here for the losing quarterbacks. So it looks like the uh, median age for the winning quarterbacks is lower than that of the, winning, of the losing quarterbacks. And this is stated accordingly. Now, now we have two more questions here, true and false, not related to any of these graphs above. First question here says, the mean of a data set can be above the third quartile or below the first quartile. Is it possible for this to happen? The answer to this is true, and let me just show you the easiest way to do it is to set up a data set. What if I had the numbers 1, 1, 1, 1, and then 100? And if they asked me to find uh, quartile 3 of this data set, uh, quartile 3 uh, is actually going to be a 1, but the mean of this data set would end up being 104 divided by 5. And that's going to give us 20.8. So clearly we can see here that the mean is way above quartile 3, so it's true. Let's look at this last one. Discounting outliers, the range of a data set will be four times the size of the IQR. This is easiest to see if you actually sketch a quick little box plot. So let me just do a rough sketch of a box plot. And it says here, the range of the data set is four times that of the IQR. Now, the IQR on a box plot actually sits right here between quartile 1 and quartile 3. That is the IQR. But be careful, on a box plot from this point here to this point, that's the range. And that represents 100% of the data. So what we're seeing is 100% of the data in the entire box plot, the IQR is 50%. So it's actually two times larger. So this here is a false statement. 1.4C wants us to determine if data has outliers using the outlier test. Um, so does the data set contain any outliers using the 1.5 IQR criteria? If so, state them. We're looking back at the book clubs, uh, number of members by week over 14 weeks. So what you want to do, so what we need to do is recall what the outlier test is. And remember, for the high end, we're going to take quartile 3 and add to it 1.5 times the IQR. Anything higher than that is an outlier. On the low end, we're going to take quartile 1 and subtract from it 1.5 times the IQR. Anything below that is an outlier. So what is IQR again? Remember the IQR is just going to be Q3 minus Q1. So we need to find these values. We already did find them in a previous example. Um, Q1 in this case is 77. Q3 in this one is 86. So all you need to do is the work for the test. So let's do the high-end test. You write this out, it would be 86 plus 1.5 times 86 minus 77. On the low end, we're going to take Q1, which is 77, and subtract from it 1.5 times that same IQR. Now be careful when you do this. You must do order of operations properly. Order of operations, do this subtraction first, and then multiply, and then take care of the adding or subtracting. Uh, when you do that, what we're going to notice 
is this will end up being 86 plus 13 and a half and then 77 minus 13 and a half. So the high value we can go is anything above 99.5 or is low anything lower than 63.5. Now they can be this values. Those values are just fine. So are there any outliers with this? Yes, we do have one. It's number 57. So in week three, when there were 57 attendees to the book club, they would be considered an outlier on the low end. And on the actual exam for this type of question, you must prove the, low, the high end and the low end of the outlier test, so, so show all the work. 1.4e will not be addressed in this exam, so let's look at 1.5a. Compute the frequency, cumulative frequency, and relative cumulative frequency. Here we have Elijah's electric usage in kilowatts per hour for the first half of the year, so by month. They want the cumulative total usage. So what we have right here, they've given us, this is actually considered frequency or the count. So what they want now is just the cumulative frequency. So remember, that's just a running total as of that time period or as of that month. So when you do the cumulative frequency, what you're going to get are these running totals right here. Now, for example, March, what I did for the running total is I added all the numbers as of March. And this here again is called cumulative frequency. Now be careful if I ask for relative cumulative frequency. That means give me the percent of the cumulative frequencies. So for example, uh, what that would be for this one would be 776 divided by the 1421. For 1.5b, construct a frequency and cumulative frequency line graphs. If we're going to use the data here about the electrical usage, draw a cumulative line graph. So they want a line graph for that, so let's just go up ahead and set up what that should look like. And what's on the x-axis versus the y. The x here is going to be the month, and this is going to be, uh, they want the cumulative frequency, so we'll put cumulative usage. So once it's set up, all we need to do is make the line graph. So January is about 275, uh, February 539, um, March 776, roughly 1,000 in April, uh, 1,200, and roughly 14. For a line graph, just connect the points, and that's what it would look like. Now be careful, any cumulative graph will always be increasing. If it was just for the particular frequencies, which are up here, the particular frequency one could actually bounce up and down, but never can a cumulative graph, either a line or a bar graph, ever show increase and then start to decline. That would be incorrect. Okay, 1.5c, interpret cumulative uh, frequency, frequency and relative cumulative frequency. That will not be addressed in this test. For 1.6a, compute and interpret sample variance and standard deviation. So they want the standard deviation of this data set down here for the parking tickets. This looks like it's a sample because we're talking about a sample here, by the way. Uh, assume that this is a sample of the police station for just this one officer. So keeping in mind, how do you find it? All you need to do is put this data into your calculator. So do uh, list one. You're going to enter the data. And after that, you're going to do a one variable stat. Now when you do it, the calculator is going to kick back and it's going to give you an X bar and some other values. What you're looking for is the S. This S value right here is a standard deviation for the particular sample. So that's the sample standard deviation. Be careful, this little O guy, that is a standard deviation of the population. So you need the S of X. Now that's standard deviation, so when you do that in the calculator, it's going to actually kick back and say it's 8.58. So you will not have to compute that by yourself, by hand. Now be careful to find the variance. Remember by definition that uh, the standard deviation is actually equal to the square root of variance. The calculator here will never give you variance. It only gives you standard deviation. So all we know is standard deviation. So what I can put in here for the formula would be 8.58 equals the square root of variance. 
well technically how would you get rid of that square root? You would come in and square it. So therefore what we know is this, is that variance is equal to the standard deviation being squared. So when you do that, what you're going to get is that the variance is going to equal for this 73.62. One point six B, they want you to compare variability using graphs or statistics. Here we have talking about book clubs. Um, so imagine the weekly data we had. It says here if a second sample of book club attendees had a larger standard deviation than that of the first sample, which sample would have more variability? The key here is to know what variability means. That means how much spread. And remember that standard deviation measures spread. So to answer this question, who has more variability? It says here that the second sample has a larger standard deviation. So the more variability would be the second sample. Learning Objective 1.6c, determine if statistics are sample or population. So we're going to go back here and look at this police officer data, keeping in mind this is the monthly number of tickets for a particular police officer that he issued. It says here, if this data is from the entire police precinct, would this data be considered a population or a sample? Is this a sample from the entire precinct or is this the entire precinct itself? Clearly, this is considered a sample. It is just one officer of the entire precinct. If this data had said it was all of the tickets for the entire precinct by month, then this data would represent, in this case, the population.